special friends, friends that are real friends, good times and bad. Let's stand to pray. <coughs> Brother, I confess that there are times that my mind wanders wrongly. And Father, you are my Father. You're also Creator. You're Judge. You're Savior. You're the Sovereign of the Universe. You're holy. You're involved. Father, today, grip our hearts with your reality. May we sense that we're in the presence of God and respond appropriately. Lord, make springtime in our heart today. Lord, the daffodils and the green grass and the budding trees and the birds singing, Lord, that's what you came to do. Thank you, Father. Amen. You may be seated. Have you ever wondered why Paul and Peter and John almost always begin their letters with the same greeting? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm beginning to sense that when they wrote that or said that greeting, it was with conviction and emotion. Grace and peace to you. Let's talk about grace a bit. Simply, one aspect of grace is like a car with a completely empty tank. You're not going anywhere if your grace tank is empty. Another way, grace is like a coat on a 20 below day. If you have a light jacket, you won't survive long. If you have a winter coat, you're better off. If you have an Eskimo seal skin coat and parka, you're happy all day if you're an Eskimo. You see, if we do not feel we need a heavy coat, grace hands us a light jacket. We receive according to our perceived and confessed need. Grace and peace to you. Peace follows grace. Peace has two aspects. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Restored relationship. And another aspect has to do with the state of our soul. And it's not a fleeting or even an abiding emotion. It's who we are. How we're put together. Peace is the wholeness and health of the soul that flows out of the grace given us. <clears throat> and of the two, grace and peace, grace always comes first. To say it another way, if you don't have grace, you won't get peace. Or you won't have a soul that is peace. So this message could be titled, How to Get Grace. Now, we're going to go with a very different title. Ten Ways That Fear Is Sin. When you hear of ten ways that fear is sin, you may conclude, I'm in sin. And then you make a choice. Receive the grace of God or go with the condemnation of the devil. So it's really about grace. In fact, well, that's, let me uh, wait for that. Let me give you a definition of grace that I intended to give at the beginning. God gives those in His favor all that they do not have and cannot deserve. This is what the Bible calls grace. This overflowing position of God. God gives those in His favor 
all that they do not have and cannot deserve. Your grace is extended to everybody, but not everybody gets grace. So grace fills the area of need in our soul. Little need, little grace. Great need, great grace. Those who see their need, own their need, and come to God for their need receive grace according to their need. When we're weak and admit it, God gives us grace strength. When we're perplexed and ask, God gives us grace wisdom. When we sin and own it, God gives us grace cleansing. He provides for all of our needs. That's grace. So every day and every scene of life, in things large and small, abundance comes to us by figuring out how to get grace. So without grace, we have discouragement, anxiety, bondage, all manner of evil. But with grace, an overflow of life and fruit, fruit in the Spirit. So how do we get grace? By seeing and owning need. And seeing our sin is one kind of need. So when is fear sin? One year in Missouri, that was a pretty exciting tornado year for us. Um, A tornado went through the little county seat of Stockton, just south of us. So one Saturday we went down to help cling up. We drove in past the house. All that I saw of the house was a foundation. And what I encountered in the cling-up makes me think that may have been what the tornado left. We had some trailers and were picking boards up out of a big adjoining field. All the time we were there, I never found one board that wasn't broken or splintered. That impressed me. And I don't know the sequence. It may have been later. But um, we got on the radio... Weather radio, the message, a tornado cloud is traveling eastward between Walker and Tiffin. And we live between Walker and Tiffin. So we went out of our house to the underground cellar, and um, we didn't get in right away. We are too curious. So we looked up and watched this boiling, gray-green, angry cloud go over our heads. Now, if I feared on that occasion, was my fear sin? Would Jesus have feared on that occasion? When is fear sin? So in my mind, this teaching isn't about fear. It's not about sin. It's about salvation. And beyond salvation... It's about the Savior. And He's the one that gives us the answers to our questions and meets our needs. You know, there's root sins and there's fruit sins. And um, root sins hide under fruit sins, often unnoticed and undetected. So what do you think? Is fear a root sin or a fruit sin? So fruit sins come in great variety, many flavors. In contrast, there's only a few root sins. These are some I would think of. Bitterness and unforgiveness, wrong values, immorality, lust, fear, hypocrisy. There may be a few others you would think of, but not many. The list is short. So root sins such as fear silently kill spiritual progress and blessings, pushing us to other sins, like high blood pressure. Fear operates by stealth. So high blood pressure can cause big problems like heart attack and stroke and kidney disease and failure, vision loss, vagina. In a similar way, fear hides under the surface, doing bad things to us but often unsuspected. So to understand the workings of fear, let's look at a few examples from the Bible. In John 9, 
Jesus heals a man born blind. And that launched a big drama. So next time you read this, just stand back and enjoy the drama. I don't know of any other story quite like this in the Bible. It starts when Jesus asks, or rather when the Jesus haters ask the healed man, who made you well? And his answers begin a series of comments and um, questions hilariously penetrating, amusingly appropriate. I mean, the Spirit of God is on that man. He said the right thing every time. So irritated by the blind man's comments, the Jesus haters ask his parents. And they shrug, he's of age, ask him. And John tells us this. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he'd be put out of the synagogue. And the parents had reason to fear. The Jesus haters rewarded the fearlessness of the blind man by kicking him out. But happily healed and beyond fear politics, the blind man seems to be relieved to be excommunicated from the synagogue of the Jesus haters. So now contrast the response of the fearful parents and the fearless healed man and consider the difference for them today, right now. Where are they now? Contrast eternal regret and eternal reward. Considering how fear determines our daily responses in the course of our life and even our eternal destiny. And now we'll look at a story Jesus told. The master said to the one talent man that hid the Lord's money, You wicked and lazy servant. And he pronounced his judgment. Cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, the wicked, lazy servant recognized something about himself that pushed him to be wicked and lazy. He said, I was afraid. And I hid the Lord's money. A root fear made the servant wicked and lazy taking him finally into outer darkness. Peter. This is a fresh one. Peter and Jesus disagreed. Jesus said, you will. Peter said, I will not. And they both were sure. You know, Peter had good reason to be sure. He had stayed with Jesus all these years. Through all the, all the experiences... He received power from Jesus to heal the sick and cast out demons. One time, Jesus said, go catch a fish. Use a coin to pay the taxes. Peter did. So Jesus accompanied Jesus every day, staying close to him, because he wanted to. And Peter loved Jesus more than he thought he could ever love anyone else. He really did love Jesus. But Jesus knew something about Peter hidden from Peter. Fear. Peter's fear, its hidden strength, overwhelmed all the good reasons he had to be confident. So fear often hides until God exposes it to us. So fear, hidden or known, will push us to other sins just as it did Peter. Now, here are some current applications. So, when two factions build up in a church, invariably, fear is pushing both sides. Maybe not everybody, but it's there. And fear narrows perspective, it distorts perception, it confuses judgment. What would happen... If the threatened brothers would have the grace to say, oh, fear is pushing me, and then resolve their fear, I dare say if they would do that, that their action would contribute to healing of the division. 
Because both sides would then gain perspective. And they'd find the freedom to find the right way to come to unity. But as long as fear is there, it's going to keep doing its dirty thing. So fear hides undetected, dividing churches. And by the way, such fear is sin. What about marriage rubs? Struggle to lead, fear. Struggle to submit, fear. Reactions that surprise us, fear. Not always, understand. Inability to express our true feelings, fear. Emotional paralysis, fear. So on many fronts, fears hides, jerking our responses in ways that surprise us. But fear doesn't always hide. Sometimes it hangs our, on our back, digging its calls in our back, and whatever we do, we can't shake it off. We know about it. We're familiar with it. But whether hidden on our back or on our back, fear makes us slaves to the devil. Hebrews 2.14 For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them from the devil. From the context, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So from childhood to old age, Satan controls us with fear. That is a general statement. So this passage gives us the first way that fear is sin. Fear is sin when the devil controls me through it. Now we have ten ways. About half of them. We will comment on, about half of them we'll just mention. This one we'll just mention. Fear is sin when the devil controls me through it. And number two, fear is sin when fear causes me to come short of the glory of God. Jesus wants to describe one way that we could show, out, show God's glory which is his, his um, hidden excellence, what, we, what couldn't be seen unless it's shown some way. Jesus said, do not worry about your life. Your heavenly Father feeds the birds. You have more value than they. Now, a person without an anxious mind about today or tomorrow, even in scary and pressured times, is going to show something about God, His faithfulness, His care for us, His love, His power, his sovereignty. So God wants us, us to show that He's a good Father. That's revealing His glory. A Father caring strongly for us, His children. But if fear causes me to be fretful, heavy, angry, in pressure times, we make God look bad. Uncaring, not wise, weak, unattractive. We fall short of the glory of God. And that's just one example. Romans 6, 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Those may not be synonymous things, but they're closely linked. And they are the, it's the conclusion that Paul brings us all to that we need a Savior. Let's look at another example. King Nebuchadnezzar did not know that when he made an idol higher than a farm silo, that he was going to see a lightning bolt of God's glory. On the dedication day of the idol, three of the king's servants just beamed out God's glory magnificently. These three, well, let's say it this way, had they caved to fear, they would have come short of a magnificent display. But because he stood fearless, proud, angry, religiously stupid Nebuchadnezzar, along with all the officials who he invited from the far corners of his empire, ended up saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then all those officials went back home and told God's glory. Because three men were fearless. 
So remember, the glory of God or the shortfall of glory happens in every scene of life. Things large and things small. And remember, Jesus never once came short of the glory of God. Anything less than His perfect light is coming short and is sin. You know, I think the thing that will will change our Christian life more than anything else is to raise our standard to fit God's standard. Because it puts all of us in need. And that's where we get grace. Now, if we're fully persuaded that anything else than the perfect life of Christ is coming short in His sin, we will receive grace and we will leap forward in freedom and spiritual prosperity. So God offers us salvation. Salvation is both powerful and simple. Not easy, but powerful and simple. Salvation comes by receiving grace. That's simple. But gracelessness lies at the root of every spiritual bondage and struggle. So how do we get grace? The answer comes to us simple and costly. To begin, we must replace our standard of righteousness with God's standard, Christ Himself. And that's hard. In fact, it can seem impossibly hard. Because God's standard leaves us lost, naked, dead, and decaying. With no possibility of self-help or any hope in a pseudo-salvation. Our standard, on the other hand, makes us feel okay. Kind of, sometimes, maybe, inadequately. Everything in us fights losing our self-made salvation. But when we lose our salvation, our salvation, we can come to God for His grace. Three verses about grace. James 4, 6. But God gives us more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. First Peter 5, 5 and 6. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. The mighty hand of God is simply that pressure you feel making you, telling you you are to go a certain way. Romans 5, 20. Where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. We win when we embrace our abounding sin. Where sin abounded, Grace abounded much more. So we come short. We fear. Our, pardon me. Sin is fear when it causes us to come short of the glory of God. And the next one, number three, fear is sin when sin lies, when lies determine my emotional response. Fear is sin when lies determine my emotional response. So I'm walking through the woods, step over a log, and jump back and say, Snake! So my companion, his courage, looks over the log and says, "Uh -uh, Stick, not snake. So is I wrong to jump back? No. If there's a rattler there, I need to jump back. I'll be bitten. I responded rightly. However, later my friend invites me to hike with him again and I decline saying, there are snakes in that woods. Count me out. If I go, I'll get a fang in my legs. So now I've made myself a problem. I've allowed a fear root to take hold of my heart. So I'll make a few points from this observation. Point number one, we respond to what we believe even if what we believe is wrong. A stick isn't a snake. But in this case, it was right to respond that way. Point number two. Fear can get a grip on our hearts with a lie we believe. And you knew those things already. When our emotional response does not correspond to facts, we fear, and that fear is sin. So mom walks to the closet door, opens it and turns on the light, And says, Jasper, there's no bear in that closet. 
But the evident fact, the mom's reassurance, does not convince her son. He remains terrified of the bear in the closet. Point number three. The lies that support fear do not easily give way to facts of the matter. Lies are stronger than facts. So, mother reassures Jasper. This is a little closet and it's full of boxes. Even a baby bear couldn't get in there. But Jasper knows there's a bear in the closet. Point number four. Fear cannot think rationally. Mr. White believes that red apples have something in them that cause cancer. So he eats golden delicious but not red apples. And he eats Granny Smith but not Lady... What are they? What kind of lady apples are they? Pink lady apples. Although he likes applesauce, he does not eat it because it may be made from red apples. In contrast, Mrs. White relishes apples, enjoys apples almost every day. Yellow, green, red striped are all the same to her. And Mrs. White's indiscriminate consumption of apples causes great concern to Mr. White because she might get cancer and die and leave him lonely and grieving. Now, you're saying that's a silly illustration. But you know, to Mr. White, it's not silly, it's serious. And what about us? Do we have everyday fears similar to Mr. White? A fear from a lie we believe to be the truth. You know, the lies we believe become the truth we live by. When our emotional response does not correspond to facts, fear results, and that fear is sin. <coughs> Often what we believe is true, but our emotional response exceeds the truth of the matter. Ask yourself, does this thought, this idea, this conclusion or feeling contain any lie or part lie? Even a very small part truth. Another question, by what authority do I know this to be true? And here we need to know the um, strength of authority. Not all authorities, quote, are equal, but that's another topic. So a nine-year-old son asked his dad, Dad, how do you spell cough? And dad said, well, that's easy. Off is O-F-F, so cough is K-O-F-F. And mom's listening in and she replies meekly, no, my dear, cough is C-O-F-F. Now that young man has a problem. Who is the authority, dad or mom? So he thinks about it, but he says, Hey, dad, let's check the dictionary on your desk. See, he had it right. He recognized a higher authority. And you know, no one, even someone that wins a national spelling spelling bee, is an absolute authority on spelling. By what authority do I know this to be true? Now get this. I may make some statements that you may contest. I'll be glad to talk to you about them. And some of these statements probably do need some qualifications sometimes or explanation. But we're keeping it simple today. But here's an absolute statement. I am never an authority. That is a truth authority on anything. Neither are you. If you and I want to know the truth for sure, we must find an authority outside ourselves. If we make ourselves an authority, we'll believe some lies, and those lies become the truth that we live by, and some of those lies will hold us in fear. Now, what authority do I know this to be true? So every thought that does not match what God says is a lie. Every belief that contradicts God's character is a lie. Every conclusion that is more or less than the facts of the matter cannot be based on truth and does not come from a sound mind. Every emotional response that does not correspond to the truth of the matter is lie-based. And some lies hold us in fear. And that fear is sin. So we have two verses here. Hebrews 6.18 It is impossible for God to lie. In Titus 1-2, God cannot lie. So God can never be the source of a lie. In contrast, 
John 8, 44. You have your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. All lies come from the devil, for he is a liar and the father of it. Look at it in another way. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. First John. But where there's lies, there's darkness. And where there's darkness, Satan hangs out. It is the lies that we have accepted and believed as truth that build the strongholds of our mind, including the stronghold of fear. And from these strongholds, Satan has a right to take over an area of our soul. Now, you may find, and I can guarantee you will, that breaking free from fear is harder than just replacing a lie with the truth. And there's a reason for that. It's not that easy. The lies we believe are often energized by a spirit power. This is a spiritual battle. But thank God through Jesus Christ, we have the answer. So fear is sin when lies determine my emotional response. And number four, fear is sin when fear keeps me from doing God's will. <clears throat> and here I give a, a definition of fear, one aspect of fear. Fear is a controlling grip that comes from anticipation of loss. Fear, fear is the controlling grip that comes from anticipation of loss. We, you won't be able to do it now, but I challenge you, find a fear that doesn't focus on loss. So we sometimes choose not to do God's will to avoid loss. And the losses are real losses. We must suffer real losses to do God's will. Often when God tells us to do something, fear plants his feet right in front of us on the path, towers over us, shouting at us, reminding us of all the things we're going to lose if we obey God. We've ex all experienced that. Now, did Jesus lose by obeying his Father to lay down his life on the cross? He lost everything. Horrific costs. So what losses came to Jesus when his father said, go in the wilderness, fast for 40 days. A lot of comfort. You know, that's enough to turn us many times. Just a little discomfort is enough to, to um, turn us from obeying God. He lost physical strength. He lost companionship, pleasure. He lost the sympathy and understanding of his friends and family. We can go right on through Jesus' life and His choices to obey the Father. He lost. What about the time Jesus replied, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you? You hypocrites! He lost a lot when He said that, didn't He? Now, if you want to turn to this passage... This is a really key passage, 1 Peter 4, verse 1. <clears throat> in this verse 1, we have the term in the flesh twice, talking about Christ's suffering and talking about us suffering. So my conclusion is that it's the same kind of suffering. And because it talks about us suffering in the flesh... I do not believe that this is focused on Jesus' physical pain on the cross. In fact, when I read the Bible and the epistles and talks about the sufferings of Christ, I don't usually think of the cross. I think of His suffering every day to do the will of the Father. <clears throat> Paul said that I might know the fellowship of His sufferings. <clears throat> so 
So 1 Peter 4.1 Since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Do you see there a key to victory in the Christian life? Suffering in the flesh. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. In verse 2, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh, and I believe that is in the body, earthly body, for the lust of men, but for the will of God. So Jesus suffered in his flesh, that is his humanness, every day of his life, that he might do the will of God. So God made us with Emotional and physical needs. Good needs. God-given. But many times God's will will cut across those needs. And when we choose God's will, suffering results. Watch as you walk. The temptation to disobey. Often focuses on the loss of human of our humanness. So fear is the controlling grip that comes from anticipation of loss. And when that keeps us from doing God's will, it is sin. And that brings us to number five. Fear is sin whenever fear projects into the future. And fear does project into the future, but so does faith. Faith projecting the future, pardon me, fear projecting the future is always sin. There's one of my um, strong statements. I really believe that. Fear projecting the future is always sin when we give way to it. The spies came back after 40 days with their report of the land of promise. And note that it was a land of promise. God promised it to them. The spies reported facts. And looking at those facts, ten spies did not, the conclusion of the ten spies did not match the promise of God nor the character of God. They believed a lie. And from that lie, projected into the future, fearing. Two spies, Caleb and Joshua, saw and reported the same facts, but came to a different conclusion. Their conclusion matched the character and the promises of God. Projecting into the future, the ten spies moaned, We're not able to go up against the people, for they're stronger than we. The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness. Why has Jehovah brought us to this land to fall by the sword? That our wives and our children should become victims. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? Thus, their fear projected into the future. In contrast, Joshua and Caleb rejoiced. The land we passed through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If Jehovah delights in us, then he'll bring us into this land and give it to us. A land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection is departed from them, <clears throat> and Jehovah is with us. Do not fear them. Thus their faith projected into the future. And if you think I'm making too much of fear, consider this fear commentary from history. When confronted with a future challenge, two men of faith urge, let us go up once and take possession, for we'll, we are well able to overcome it. Get that. Two soldiers. 600,000 men slash cowards cried buckets of tears all night, sobbing. We're not able to go up against the people. Get that. 600,000. Two soldiers versus 600,000. Two versus 600,000 is three ten thousandths of one percent. 
What does this historic fact tell us about fear? But the story of the spies, that's an unusual case. Not a typical ratio. Well, before you swallow that conclusion, consider some more facts. Recall all that these people witnessed and experienced in their deliverance from Egypt and their protection and provision from along the way. Every step was a purposeful preparation for this decisive moment. Recall the amazing revelations, the impossible ventures, the grueling hardships and deep sacrifices. From slavery to journey, from Egypt to desert, from ignorance to revelation, from irreligious to Jehovah worshipers, from nobodies to God's chosen people, from the Passover to the banks of the Jordan, with many mighty signs and wonders and miraculous daily provision. Yet, yet, only paralyzing fear. You know, only faith can displace fear in our hearts. And that kind of faith is uncommon. We never have good reason to fear into the future. Get this. Jesus never once projected into the future with fear. And he tells us, have no anxious thought about tomorrow. We cannot live tomorrow's troubles nor fight tomorrow's battles. We sin when we borrow sorrow from tomorrow. So fear is sin when fear projects in the future. And that brings us to number six. <coughs> fear is sin when fear is given room in me by unlove. And just a few quick points here. Perfect love casts out fear. Fear is self-serving. And self-serving, self Focusing fear and feebles love. God is love. If we have unlove, we are nothing. And you know this verse. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have unlove, I am nothing. My translation. Fear is sin when fear is given room in me by unlove. Number seven, fear is sin when fear grabs me because I doubt God's love. We can discover what we really believe about our Heavenly Father's loving care for us by the way we respond in the scenes of life. We doubt God because we consider our conclusions superior to His word and character and that is sin. When fear grabs us because we doubt God's love. It's sin. <clears throat> Number eight. When I fear because I disconnect from heavenly reality. And this would be one I would like to talk to. There's so much potential in connecting to heavenly reality. Fear is sin when I fear because I disconnect from he heavenly reality. So every spiritual things, thing comes from one of two sources. In the book of Romans we read, whatever is not of faith is sin. When we fear because we disconnect from heavenly reality, we sin. And number nine, fear is sin when fear originates from a demon and I accept it. Fear is sin when fear originates from a demon and I accept it. And number ten. Fear is sin when my response is different than Jesus' response. Now this um, overlaps some of the other ways fear is sin and it sums up all the ways. But it stands alone as a key to all of them. So let's read a story here. We know the story, Mark 4, verse 35. On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now they had left the multitude. They took him, him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with them. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, 
Do you not care that we're perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Now I'm going to ask questions. Some of them are obvious and I won't answer them. And others I'll just answer quickly. His questions to go down several tracks. Who on the boat that day revealed God's glory? If someone would have observed the disciples on this occasion, would they have seen God's faithfulness, His power, His truthfulness, His wisdom displayed in their responses? So the disciples all fell short of God's glory, just like the Bible says. We all fall short of God's glory. Who on the boat revealed God's glory? One person. Only Jesus. That is a very foundational fact to our salvation. Who in this room today does not come short of the glory of God? There is one person in this room. Jesus. And that is always true wherever we are. In the first three and a half chapters of Romans, Paul stacked overwhelming evidence to bring us to this conclusion. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So each of us must decide how we respond to this fact. We could ignore it. We have a serious problem. We have a shortfall. We're condemned, we're under God's wrath, but we can ignore it. Or we can decide we will save ourselves. It's a very common response. Or we can make room in our heart for grace. Now let's go down another track. What did the disciples believe? Well, their words tell us what they believed. We're perishing. What was their perceiving, reasoning, believing process? By the way, that is the most important thing about a person. Their perceiving, reasoning, believing process. Forget the surface things and understand what's going on inside you and other people. Um, Well, this is what it could be. The boat's filling. The boat will sink. So obviously, we're going to the bottom. Good logic. Was their conclusion true? Did they believe Jesus? And you will remember, Jesus said, we're going to the other side. Did they believe themselves and their conclusions? So who did they believe? We could ask this. Did they believe a lie? Did someone tell them a lie? Was there any being around that wanted them to believe a lie? One of the most helpful things we can do is sometimes or many times ask ourselves this question. Who said that? By believing a lie, were the disciples in harmony with the nature of God or the nature of Satan? Let's think down another track. Do we see fear projecting into the future in this story? When they said we're perishing, were they afloat in the boat or sinking to the bottom? Did they perish? Did the disciples sin by allowing fear to project into the future? Did Jesus have the least bit of fear in this storm? Remember, he is our standard of freedom from fear. Did the disciples have faith? And you might say, yeah, they came to Jesus and said, save us. But what did Jesus say? How is it that you have no faith? Did the disciples sin? Yes, 
The disciples sinned. They responded without faith. Whatever is not of faith is sin. Did the disciples sin? Yes, they believed a lie. And lies harmonize with the nature of Satan. Did the disciples sin? Yes, they fell short of the glory of God. Their response made God look untrustworthy, uncaring, in fact, a liar. Did the disciples sin? Yes. They allowed fear to project in the future. And allowing fear to project in the future is always sin. Now, one more track. This is the important one. Did Jesus cut off his disciples because he had no faith on this occasion? Did they lose their relationship with Jesus because of their sin? Why not? Discipleship is not somehow desperately becoming perfect so that hopefully God will accept me. What must one do to be a disciple? Simply walk with Jesus a day at a time to learn of Him. And with that, make Him our standard. The twelve made the right choice. They chose that day to be with Jesus one more day. And specifically, when Jesus said, get in the boat, they got in the boat. They did the right thing. Jesus chose their lesson that day. And on this occasion, the test came before the lesson. And that often happens in our walk with Jesus. And Jesus teaches us in the same way, even when we fall short without faith. You know, in discussions about fear, we often have a flawed perspective in our appeal to natural dangers to justify fear. You understand that? Okay. So somebody is in a place of obvious danger. So, okay, it's, it's okay to fear there in that place. Um, but what about Jesus? Jesus knew that nothing could harm Him. And this was every day of His life. Jesus knew that nothing could destroy God's will for Him, or God's plan for His life, I should say. Not natural dangers, not people, not the devil himself. Simply, He had no reason to fear. In God's will, if I'm in God's will, nothing can harm me. That doesn't mean that nothing bad will happen to me. Bad things happen to Jesus too. In God's will, as I'm in God's will, nothing can destroy God's plan for my life. That is as true of me as it was of Jesus. And I hear Jesus saying to me, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? I fear because I believe that I can lose something. But nothing has happened ever that made my God a loser. So in Him and His purposes, I can't lose. I am a guaranteed winner. So how do we come free from fear? We'll conclude with this. And I'm going to just read several things here. Quickly, I'll repeat them. So if you're writing, you are able to write them. Number one, identify fear. Discover where it hides. Identify fear. Discover where it hides. Two, confess fear as fear and confess fear as sin. In other words, call it by its name. Confess fear as fear and confess fear as sin. Three, choose to make a clean break with fear. Repent. Choose to make a clean break with fear. Repent. And number four is an important one, a key. Give up trying to get rid of fear to be accepted by God. Notice in the epistles where we're taught salvation. It's always acceptance by God first and then it's overcoming the power of sin. That sequence is, is essential. It never works the other way around. So number four, give up trying to get rid of fear to be accepted by God. Number five, believe Romans 5.1. Come to 
rest in your acceptance with God. When we're at rest, and then we can overcome the power of sin. We can receive grace. Otherwise, we're just blocking grace at every turn. Without grace, we're dead in the water. Number six, stand in grace. Romans 5, 2. I haven't thought much about that. I'd like to think more about that. Stand in grace. That's a Bible phrase. Stand in grace. Number seven, when fear rises, thank God for an opportunity to overcome fear. You know, this actually, when we come to these circumstances, this is our opportunity. This is, this, is, this is the way it happens. This is the way we get free. We recognize it and we walk through it with Jesus and we learn from Him how He lived above fear. We can't do it without walking with Him in those, things, in those um, realities of life. And number eight is put on anti-fear. And here I want to just note how important put on is in um, New Testament theology. So I just read these quickly. The number eight is put on anti-fear. Romans 13, 14. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 3, 27. Put on Christ. Ephesians 4, 24. Put on the new man. Ephesians 6.11, put on the whole armor of God. Colossians 3.10, put on the new man. Colossians 3.12, put on spirit fruit. It names it there. And Colossians 3.14, but above all these things, put on love. And perfect love casts out fear. So there is no sinful fear in Christ. Let's put on Christ. There is no sinful fear of the new man. Put on the new man. And that's what the Christian life's all about. So we find a description of the new man, which is Christ in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. That's what the new man looks like. Each fruit of the Spirit is anti-fear in its special way. It would be a Kind of fun to develop that. But you think about it. Love is anti-fear in the love way. Um, joy is anti-fear in a joy way. Very, very powerful anti-fear. The fruit of the Spirit describes the character and life of Christ. Christ's life in us leaves no room for fear. When we fear, we know that we must increase in the attractive substance of anti-fear. The root of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the life of Christ. Finally, let's look at one of the fruit of the Spirit, peace. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you? Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Peace is the wholeness and health of the soul that flows out of the grace of God. A soul untroubled by peace. Peace is not just a passing emotion or even an abiding emotion. It is the state of a soul that's made healthy by God. That idea of peace has the idea of correctly being put together inside. I just repeat that. Peace is the wholeness and health of the soul that flows out of the grace of God, a soul untroubled by fear. So, brothers and sisters, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Dwight, for sharing that truth with us today. Many things to digest and think about. Does someone have uh, something you would like to share? A way of testimony or confession? Just go ahead, raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you. Go ahead. That was a very powerful message. I, I, I really like that message because I, my middle name is Fear. <laughs> I always seem to fear everything. I mean everything. And I, I praise God for Dwight's message. I, I, I really like that message. 
I needed that. Amen. Thank you, Richard. Fear is the controlling grip that comes from the anticipation of loss. So fear and control often walk hand in hand. So what is it that I am trying to control in my life? What is driving me to that? When Dwight uh, gave that definition, my mind went to what Jesus said in a couple of different places, but I just picked out the one here in Matthew. Jesus said to His disciples, If any man will come after Me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow Me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. That's what fear does. We try and save our lives. We desperately try and save our lives. And we end up losing. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Incredible principle of the kingdom. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. The picture I get when I read that verse is releasing control. Losing control. Releasing control. Releasing that fear. And we will find a freedom of life we never knew existed. Anyone else have something you want to share? Hand right here in the middle. I really appreciated the message. I feel that that's something God has been speaking to me about. And I, the words that have been going through my mind the last while is, why be a slave when you can be free? Mm. And I thank Jesus for freedom. Thank you, brother. It's a good word. Thank you for listening. We hope this message has blessed you. If you would like additional messages, please visit our website at ccfsermons.org. Call us at 855-55-CHARITY or write to us at Charity Christian Fellowship, 59 South Groffdale Road, Leola, PA, 17540. This ministry is supported by your donations. May Jesus Christ be Lord of all.